Elizabeth started off talking about how, in a sense, we need simplification, standardization, and a more willingness to share so we don't reinvent the wheel every time, because a lot of times these projects do present the same sort of uh, issues or challenges. Then we had uh, Torre saying, wait a second here, you know, we just focus too much on efficiency. We have to think outside the box uh, more. Uh, if we don't, we're not going to be on the cutting edge of what happens in what we see in other parts of technology, be it air nab, so on and so forth. Your thoughts, and then I want to go to you, Clay and Jose. Yeah. Yeah, it could very well be that uh, we should uh, look into the totally different ways of working together, but I think we should also take this opportunity when the situation is as it is in the industry uh, to take those uh, shortcut uh, possibilities uh, because we have been discussing uh, standardization and so on for many years, and I don't underestimate the importance of it. But then I think that each individual part of the value chain has to make up its mind where can we contribute. And as a ship owner, we know that we can contribute for cost reductions and emission reduction. I think we have two main challenges in the industry. We have a cost issue and we have an environmental issue. Mm -hmm. And for us, we said we have for many years been working with how can we reduce consumption of fuel on our vessels. When we do that, we reduce uh, cost for our customers and we reduce emissions. Uh, and that's why we operate for approximately 50% of the LNG powered uh, uh, PSVs on the Norwegian continental shelf. Uh, and the last two one, we take down fuel consumption with 25%. And that's why it was very encouraging very recently that we, together with Lundin, announced that on the Viking Queen, which is on a contract to, to Lundin, we, in, we install a battery package, a fully integrated bat battery package, where we reduce fuel consumption for Lundin with 20% and 20% reduction. That is the kind of entrepreneurial spirit I would like to see more of. We see it with Lundin, we don't see it with all the other majors. Jose, how to make sure we don't end up prisoners, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, I wanted to say that I disagree on the point of creativity. Uh, I do agree that in order to have, to have a creative environment, you want a diverse group of people, different thinkers. Uh, however, I believe, and I believe that all of us, doesn't matter, you don't need to be an engineer, all of us are creative. The problem that I, I see here is that the barriers to entry to innovate. Remember, creativity, you just invent things. You become an innovator when you implement the thing and deliver some value. So the, the problem that we're facing is, if I have an idea today during launch, talking th by the networking we're going to have today, the chances that I make that idea reality are very slim. Why? Because if I'm the creator, if I'm the, the NOVs of this world, the OEMs, they need to ask me permission to put their thing underwater. And I'm, the, the natural reaction is going to be, no, no, I'm not going to take that liability. You test your thing somewhere, but they cannot test it because they don't have the vessel. So, and then if you want to put it in a live well, you need to talk to the, op to the operator, and the operator is going to say, why do I need to test your product unless there's something for me? And that is the problem of the lack of collaboration. If we collaborate, we break this cycle, and now everybody will be willing, hey, you have something that delivers value to me, I'll let you use it in my rig, it, it will go to an operator. So how do we create this new model which could deliver uh, not only greater efficiency for the industry, but greater opportunities? Collaboration. We just need to... Co to but collaboration's a word. Give me some specific uh, no, examples well, the, 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 the specific is actually, uh, instead of being inward looking, try to create open innovation, trying to bring other companies along and create these partnerships to deliver that value. Clay, can we do a better job here? Are we doing enough of it? You, you mentioned I, what you're doing. I think we can. We, we absolutely need creativity. Creativity. We need the innovation that Tor referenced. And, uh, uh, but I think there's a second element that's required, which is the implementation of these ideas in a new uh, project management system. We need to manage smarter. I think a lot of ways the limiting factor has become uh, management limitations around the complexity of the projects that we're, we're undertaking. So really two things are required, the, cre the creation, the invention, the purposeful innovation, but also a smart industrially based uh, project uh, management uh, team that really sets up the, the, that, that new technology for success. Stand on that, because that's a really important part uh, of this, management limitations. You're not suggesting these aren't smart people, but what's the no. link that they're missing? It's how we work together, which to me, this is the key uh, that, that collaboration uh, offers, the success that collaboration offers to how we, how we work together. I, th I think what we need at the center is a, is a customer that understands the business purpose for what they're undertaking, that sees that entire vision and, and really has helped shape that opportunity, surrounded by a team 
that has a shared consciousness about what that opportunity looks like, supported by teams across the industry that help make that happen. And what's missing, I think, is the interaction, not between the supply chain and the customer, but the, the interaction between the teams themselves. We need to remove the friction um, that's often in place when it comes to communication between teams, to make one, uh, if you will, team of teams to execute these, these projects. But, but I think uh, all we are talking about here, very often we are talking about technical uh, shifts. And, and I think the main, or at least based on my experience, the limiting factor is not technology, because technology is running ahead of <laughs> behavioral change. So the, the key limiting factor is people. And I like Peter's uh, view graph where he had the passion or the spirit in the center. And I, I think that is the key. You need people that dare, people that dare to do mistakes. Very often we see that people are so afraid of doing mistakes, they are do doing nothing new. And then we are very surprised that we are not seeing innovation. Oh, what is that about? So we must build a culture. We must build a culture where it's allowed to fail, but you should fail fast and only do that mistake once. Okay, yeah, strong, strong statements, and that's a very Silicon Valley type of uh, uh, okay. thinking. Which is, no, which is, I think, you know, and look, look who's leading the world in certain types of uh, technologies. Okay, yes, Elizabeth, your thoughts on all this. Basically, you know, you know, how does Offshore need to rethink its business in terms of new partnerships and perspectives? We, we've heard about the need for a sort of greater collaboration along the complete change. We've heard about uh, the problem oftentimes is the communication between teams. We have to have a mentality that, you know, failure is okay. You know, your thoughts on this, Torstein, I think you may have a slightly different view because you're saying basically it's about efficiency unless I'm misunderstanding you. And Jan Frederick, please, Elizabeth now, yeah. I'm thinking, I mean, I very much agree with what Tula started off with. Let, let's not cut costs to sort of the expense of creativity and new solutions and implementing new technology. but. Everything at its time and for its purpose. We need to be able to collaborate, to standardize, to simplify on one arena, and, and we need to be able to implement those solutions together. And we need to be able to collaborate in settings where new technology can be developed and implemented. Uh, and I think, Clay, you had an, a very good point uh, when you said that shared responsibility can be, well, what do you say, something by sort of no, no responsibility, basically. Uh, and, and we cannot go there with collaboration, but at the same time, we need to open up some of the interfaces between mm. our companies, in whether it is in technology development or whether it is in operation. There needs to be more transparency between the different parties that that's involved in, in operations. Thorstein, uh, Jan Frederick, and then uh, Ture, you want to say something again? Yes. Yeah. I think we're of the opinion that when it comes to a kind of a major platform project, that is, it all ends up with quality, delivery on time, and what is the CapEx going to be. But in the, the, the super creative part, when you're finding a resource, that is really what I'm hearing now is, is like music in my ears. Because we're, we're, we're always been a kind of a sucker for the beta. We've always been a beta user for some of the things that aren't really on the market yet. So we're actually talking to quite a few of the supply or, or service providers from 3D seismic all the way up to testing, et cetera, for things that aren't really there, but will give us the interpretive power to see things that other people overlooked. And Jose, he's a man who's willing to take the risk. Remember how you said sometimes it stops right there because you have the creative force, but no one's willing to take the risk. This is a man who's willing to take risk. Yeah, Jan Frederick, yeah. Just to follow up on the issue of uh, availability of technology, we have seen so many examples where technology is there. You go to your main customers, but there's a kind of a tendency of a culture whereby the safest thing to do is to do nothing or do it as we did yesterday. So we see a lacking entrepreneurial spirit and this brave uh, willingness to do something different. But to be very specific within the industry I'm a part of, we are running contractual um, structures which are extremely old-fashioned. Time charter, where the customer pays for the fuel. And I know that the, when our customers are the oil companies, in, in, for all practical purposes, they really don't want to have a reduction of the consumption of fuel in the world. Of course not, because that's what they are living off. But those who are running the budgets, at least, internally in the old companies, they would like to see it happen. So we have tried to see, can, can't we run a pilot project where we pay for the fuel ourselves? Because we need incentives. I don't have the sufficient incentives myself 
to go to my people and say that we need to invest money. Why should we invest money? It's the customer who take the benefit. So to look into contractual relationships also in the offshore shipping part of it is I think definitely we need to do. And it could save a lot of money. Okay, what would those incentives be and how would that lead to greater collaboration? Now, simply the fact that we can invest the necessarily not the big amounts in different kind of technical solutions related to our engines, related to our control systems, where we reduce fuel with 3% here, 5% there, and so on and so forth. Uh, but if, when you come to the customer, except from a customer like Lundin, but to the others, they say, well, we need to open up the contract then. We need to give you an additional rate, and that's difficult, because then I have to have that sanctioned somewhere in my organization, and that's, that is dangerous. So let's do it as, as it is. I mean, this willingness to find new solutions, even though it's a little bit complicated, but if you don't want to take the complicated issues, then we will not make a big change. Whose role is it? Uh, uh, Tore, please answer first, yeah. yeah. What I think is important to understand is that there are two time scales. There are the short time scale where efficiency, of course, is important and cost cutting during these times. So I'm not forgetting about that. I agree on that. That is important. But what I'm afraid of is that we are forgetting about the long term part. When we are coming through this downturn, what is it we are going to do then? And we have to pr start preparing now for that, uh, that phase. And that is what I'm afraid. You are investing too much in, in today's situation and, and challenges and forgetting about the future. What I'm trying to address mm. is that we need to have to, uh, th uh, two thoughts in our head at the same time, short term and also longer term. And, and that is important. And, and then I would also like to add that we are using too little the universities and the university colleges. There is a lot of potential that is not taken out of cooperating between the universities, the university colleges, and the, 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 the uh, businesses. So there's a lot of potential. You know, it's interesting. I think at low oil prices, we actually see a, more, a higher willingness in some instances uh, by our customers of taking risks and trying new ideas. You know, in a lot of ways, um, if, if you're operating in a $100 a barrel world, uh, there's a lot of incentive to kind of keep going with the status quo. At $50 a barrel, you have to do something different. The status quo is not working. And so actually in a $50 world, there's more freedom to uh, think more broadly, think outside the box, and undertake uh, more, yeah. more radical sorts of solutions. Very interesting perspective. Uh, Thorstein, would you agree with that? And then Elizabeth, your thoughts as uh, someone who works across classes, yeah. I think you got right on it right there because we heard earlier that, well, the barn sea is not gonna be commercial. It's not about the oil price to a certain degree, but do you find enough resource? That's gonna be, and, and, and hopefully it's gonna be black oil. At least that's why we're there. And uh, because if you sit, if you find like Johan Sverdrup, close to or more than three billion barrels, if the oil price falls to 30, it's still a very viable prospect and a project. And of course, uh, we all know that you're not going to find a Johan Sverdrup around every corner, but you need to prove up the necessary resource base in the Barents Sea in a good, safe manner. But yes, it's going to be high risk because you heard a little earlier that someone definitely wouldn't put her money on us. We, we, th that's quite okay because if you look back over the 11 years, we've been in a major discovery every third year. And every one of those can withstand an oil price of 50. So if you do it right, this business is there to stay, at least in my view. 